Yeah. Hi there, I'm Paul Rosen. I'm head of expeditions for National Geographic Pristine Seas. And I've been with the project for 12 years and we've been working from the Arctic to the Antarctic and all the warm places in between. I'm recently back from the Solemn Islands in the Southwest Pacific. Pristine Seas was developed by Enric Saller. And he, he looked at the ocean and realized there was a lot of science papers happening, but who was doing something to protect the ocean? So why not find, explore, and help protect the last wild places in the ocean? So we do that. We go and help protect the most vital places in the world's ocean. We've completed 45 expeditions. We've helped protect just under 7 million square kilometers of the ocean. We've published over 300 science papers and we've helped to create 29 marine reserves. We were off of the Three Sisters Islands in the Solomons, a beautiful, beautiful space place. We were being hosted by Chief Dennis Marita, uh, who has an island there and it's a, a small island that has been preserved and looked after and protected by his community. And we were really enjoying our diving there. And we were on the move, you know, these expeditions, we we're on the move. We've got a lot of ground to cover, comprehensive surveys in a big area. So we had dropped some remote cameras to the north of the island and we were on a mission that we were finished at this island and the next morning head off, collect these cameras and continue our passage. And Dennis came out and joined us for, this is Chief Dennis, came and joined us for a submarine dive. He loved it. It was his first time going deep in his own waters, which was a beautiful experience. And it sort of reinforced his passion for ocean conservation. And I just wonder if that submarine dive didn't bring a little magic to the day. Because later that day, our lead underwater filmmaker, Manu San Felix, made an opportunistic dive on something that on the chart is marked as a shipwreck and it's just a shape underwater. Manu went in, a man who is, all, all, is also a marine scientist, and he stopped short and he said, hang on, this coral is absolutely massive. He'd never seen anything like it. So he came back to the ship really excited to say, hey, we need to put the brakes on and go and study this thing properly. Now it's complicated, Joe, because suddenly stopping the rhythm and the pattern of work that we lay out is a real complicated thing. We've got cameras that have been dropped that come up at certain times, we need to recover them. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So we listened to him, we put a team in the water quickly and realized it was absolutely huge. So it was complete luck, but we didn't quite know how big it was. So then we decided we would put a team together. Um, there was about 11 in the team to dive it very early in the morning at first light. They went in and with our lead scientist, Molly, everyone quickly discovered it really was the world's largest coral. So we sent the information back up to National Geographic headquarters. They did a whole bunch of analysis and due diligence. And we, within one day, could happily say, guess what? We've just found the world's largest coral. So how about that for a highlight of a long expedition? <laughs> yeah, well, it's big. And, you know, uh, and just to clarify, when you swim along a coral reef or you see a coral reef, you know, it's all different colors and shapes. And that's what makes it so beautiful and vibrant. Um, but this is one single coral. So if you looked at one of those shapes or colors and thought, oh, there's a nice coral. It might be the size of a table. It might be the size of a car or if it was a big one. But one of them is, is one coral. This thing is one particular coral. And it's about 30, 34 meters wide and 32 meters long, which is much bigger than a blue whale, which is the largest living thing on the planet. It's really, really massive. And because it's this sort of beautiful reddish brown, it has a presence. It's a big, whopping great presence. Um, we haven't done a complete, a complete analysis of the age, but it's around about 300 years old. So it's seen a lot of action. It's seen a lot of climate change. It's seen a lot of overfishing. It's in an area where it isn't very pristine, but it's hanging in there. And it's hanging in there because it's in an area that is protected by the people of the Three Sisters Island, particularly in Malaulu Island.
Yep, it's a bit cooler down there, and that, that means it's great. It's below the threshold of the, the real impact for warm water, which is a great thing. And uh, Chief Dennis, um, uh, Dennis Marita at Malala Island, he's got this voluntary marine reserve, which, which works up to a point. I mean, it's not legally protected. It's not enforced with, with um, you know, satellite tracking and, and, and protection vessels. It's quite small, um, but it is protected, and it's somewhat respected, but around him, there's a lot of overfishing going on. So the overfishing combined with uh, global warming means it's in a hazardous environment. So it's a bit deeper, it's bigger, and it's a miracle of survival. Um, and it just goes to show, doesn't it, Joe, that if, if you leave bits of the ocean alone, it demonstrates a remarkable capacity to recover. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, and it gives uh, the people of the Solomon Islands um, a great sense of hope and promise and resilience of their own ocean. Well, my life in exploration began because I couldn't do school. I just, I just didn't like it, Joe. I wasn't doing very well. I couldn't convert uh, what was really happening in my life. And I'm talking when I was 11, 13 years old. So it wasn't much, but my life, which was physical, and I couldn't get into what was up on the screens, on the boards, or in the books. I just couldn't translate it to being anything useful. The, um, I was anxious to leave school. At 15, uh, along with a couple of other mates, I ran away from school. I was very happy to leave. Um, and during that period, I realized I was going to be a diver. And that was an amazing moment because it all came from watching television. I was watching Sea Hunt. And, you know, the, 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 the mythical, you know, uh, diving, you know, going down, having proper, proper adventures seemed a lot better than me uh, trying to convert things in school. I just couldn't do it. So I knew I was going to be a diver. I had no idea how to be a diver. Very fortunately, during my apprenticeship as a toolmaker, um, I discovered diving and I started diving in 1969 and never looked back. And anytime I talk like this, Joe, about that first dive in 1969, I can feel that moment diving in the English Channel on the south coast of Britain, Easter, freezing cold, sideways rain, homemade wetsuit, and going in and all the seams in my homemade wetsuit beginning to come unglued and the ocean coming in. And instantly I felt like an explorer. I knew I was an explorer at that moment. Of course, I wasn't. I was a brand new diver. But I was in the world's largest, most powerful, most beautiful, least understood, least protected ecosystem on Earth. And I was in that. I was an ocean diver, an ocean explorer. I couldn't believe it. Late, Much later in life, I became a a mountain guide and I was guiding in the mountains and working for science in the polar regions. And it was it's that life that keeps me going, Joe. You know, meeting scientists with hairy, audacious, you know, ambitious plans and converting those plans into action in the field. You know, converting those very plans that have been developed in a laboratory into icebreakers and helicopters and high performing teams in tents and research stations and submarines. It's incredibly satisfying for a non-scientist to be there. So, you know, one thing I would say to young ones um, um, is that if you want to work in these exciting front lines as an explorer, just find something that you love and there's probably a chance it can be applied to a science expedition. You know, carpentry, cooking, driving boats. If you want to be an airplane pilot, if you want to be a plumber, a doctor, a dentist, all these jobs exist in exciting places working for science. And there you are, an explorer, not just for your own adventures, but you're also making a big difference and contributing to global science.